Hi everyone, and welcome to our first Westwatch webinar of 2023. Uh, what is Westwatch? Um, oh, let's see, I'm getting a little feedback here. So if I can have folks just get on mute for a sec. There we go. Um, what is Westwatch? Uh, Westwatch is a monthly webinar series that brings together NOAA staff and our partners from across the region to share information about climate observations and impacts across the West. In the recent past, Westwatch has been quarterly, but we're increasing the frequency to monthly uh, in 2023. And uh, as we say on the bottom here, we're gonna have two formats. We're experimenting with, uh, with a new way of doing Westwatch. We're gonna alternate between a panel session uh, with guest speakers on a particular event or topic like today, uh, and then in those other months, we'll do the kind of old school or the OG version of Westwatch, uh, led by the Western Regional Climate Center and our three IUS partners. So if you tuned in hoping to hear from Dan and Clarissa and Jan and Henry, don't worry, they will have the stage uh, next month. And given all the things that have happened along the West Coast since December, I think it will be a very exciting uh, seminar. Um, but today we also have a great seminar and we're gonna talk about the McKinney Fire. Uh, that took place in uh, August of 2022 in uh, Northern California in the Klamath River Basin and the uh, subsequent de debris flow. And uh, we'll be um, kind of hearing a bit about it from the, uh, you know, a perspective, a meteorological and hydrological perspective, as well as talking about the impacts on the landscape and on fisheries. And the goal in diving into this event is to add some texture into what we we talk about as a compound climate hazard, which can be kind of a, an abstract uh, a concept. Um, but I think this event really illustrates uh, what a compound climate hazard is. And uh, I think showing kind of that it's more uh, complex than just thinking about a fire, or just thinking about a flood event, or just thinking about a water quality event. So a bit of quick housekeeping. I actually forgot to introduce myself. I'm Joe Casola. I'm the Western Regional Climate Services Director. Um, and uh, I'm really glad to have our speakers here today and I'm gonna introduce them uh, in a second. Before I get to all that though, I did want to share a quick poll with the audience. Part of our new format is we're gonna try to be a little more interactive so folks can take a second and try to answer this poll question. I would appreciate it. Great, that looks like about a 90% return on the, or a response rate, which is good enough for me. Uh, but a lot of new time uh, viewers, which is great, about 70% of the audience uh, looks like it, this might be their first time at Westwatch. So so welcome, and uh, we hope that will be, be a great session for you. Um, so the rest of kind of the, uh, the rundown um, will be, uh, each of the speakers will speak for about 10 minutes. If you have questions, please enter those into the questions box at the right. Uh, we'll do brief Q&A after each speaker. And then if we have some time at the end, which I hope we will, uh, we'll, we'll do some more Q&A. This session will be recorded and we'll share that link with you uh, after the recording uh, so you can come back and, and take a look at it or, or pass on to colleagues. We'll also have a post webinar survey that comes up right at the end. And we appreciate your feedback about this session as well as any ideas for future sessions. All right, today's speakers, we're really, really appreciative to have these folks with us. Uh, we have Tom Wright from the Weather Service Office in Medford, Tim Bailey the, from the Watershed Research and Training Center in Eureka, Spencer Higginson also from the Weather Service Office in Medford, and Sherry Whitmore from NOAA Fisheries uh, in the uh, Central California office. And I'll introduce each speaker a little bit more as uh, right before their talk, but I'm gonna switch things over to Tom. And while I do that, I will give him a quick introduction. Tom Wright is the Observation Program Leader and an Incident Meteorologist for the National Weather Service Office in Medford, Oregon. As the observation program leader, Tom manages the Cooperative Observer Program, which consists of 83 weather observing stations across Medford's 50,000 square mile service area, which is located in southwestern Oregon, northern California. 
as in IMET, Tom assists incident command teams on wildfires with a primary focus on personnel, public safety, and weather forecasting for technical operations. Tom has been deployed to 33 fires, including the McKinney fire, where he was the first I met on an incident. So thank you, Tom, and hopefully uh, you can take it away. Yeah, I think I've taken it here and you should be able to see my screen now. It looks like uh, audience views all got it, so I think we're good. <clears throat> I was all prepared for my first slide to give myself a brief introduction, but I guess I don't have to now that Joe's done such a good job. Um, Basically, what I wanted to touch on here was uh, I'm, I'm focusing on the flash flood that occurred in the Humbug Creek on the McKinney Fire. As mentioned, I was the first meteorologist on the McKinney Fire, and I was there um, August 1st, and then the flood occurred August 2nd. And there were other flash floods or debris flows on the fire on that day, but I didn't know about them. So this was the one that was where we had crews trapped, and we had this poor soul here who was trapped in his truck trying to drive through the water. So that's the one I'm gonna focus on because that's the one I know the most about. And then I know others will touch on, on other parts of the flood and actually subsequent debris flows that have occurred since um, as we've gotten into the winter season. So that's what I'm gonna to touch on. And uh, I'll promise you I'll have a, at least one picture on most of the slides and there'll be some math in this, but luckily you won't have to do the math, I'll do it for you. But I think you're actually gonna enjoy this map this time. So we'll see. Here is the flash flood timeline from my perspective, and there's only a couple of things I wanted to touch on here. First off is what I'd mentioned. I arrived on the incident on August 1st, and um, we had a red flag warning issued um, at two o'clock on the 1st, so we had that out already from the Weather Service office in Medford, and I alerted the command staff of the thunderstorm and the flash flood and debris flow potential uh, at our six o'clock briefing on the 1st. I also gave the crews in the morning a briefing on the thunderstorms and the extreme rainfall, flooding, debris flow, et cetera, probabilities for the day. Uh, three o'clock in the afternoon, a general thunderstorm alert was issued for thunderstorms in the area that weren't imminent on the fire, but just so that they had a heads up that something was starting to develop. And then at 642, the thunderstorms, uh, I issued an alert for the thunderstorms with heavy rain, flash flooding, and so forth as they were on radar and starting to come toward the fire. And then just over, or a little bit less than an hour and a half later at eight o'clock, we got the first reports of flash flooding on Humbug Creek. And now you'll see a map coming up of the uh, fire perimeter of the McKinney fire in black. And we also have the soil burn severity map on here. And the, that's in the colors there. So moderate is in yellow, so moderate burn severity, and then high se burn severity in the uh, red colors. And what I have outlined there in red is the approximate area of the drainage for Humbug Creek. So there are multiple forks to Humbug Creek. And I think this is this is actually the main Humbug Creek drainage that I've got outlined here. So all of that area flows into, let me try the highlighter here. Oops. Um, so this area right here is where Humbug Creek and the bridge and most of the videos that I'll show you were shot. And so all of this area here flows down in down the drainage and all comes through that area. And I've zoomed in on, on it here so you can see there's an area called the OHV area and there's some videos from near there. And then the road comes across here and there's a bridge right in here. So this is the bridge that you'll see in the videos coming up. And here's the math I've got for you. Um, I did a quick uh, outline in Google Earth and came up with eight and a half square miles for that drainage. And that works out to 238 million square feet, which we had, I haven't mentioned it yet, but we had two to three inches of rain. So if I take the worst estimate of three inches and multiply that out to give us a volume of water, that's 59.5 million cubic feet. And since we know how many gallons are in a cubic foot, that equates to one and a half or one half billion gallons. So a half a billion gallons. And of course it didn't all come through that drainage, but it was all, uh, or at least a lot of it was forced through that small constriction right there. And so that the result is what you'll see in the slides we have coming up. So that's the only map I have in the whole slideshow, so you can relax now, no more map quizzes. And now I want to give you uh, just a quick meteorological setup of what was going on that day. So if you're not a meteorologist, um, I'll try to explain some of this stuff. But on the left is the upper, upper level chart, a 500 millibar chart, which is the conditions about 18,000 feet above the ground. And it shows a pretty large upper level trough offshore, so low pressure offshore, and that was bringing southerly winds in, and of course, here's Oregon, Northern California, 
McKinney's right around there. So it was bringing southerly flow up over us. The picture on the right is uh, sounding. And so that's where we send up the weather balloon twice a day. This one comes out of Medford and it shows really moist conditions. So on the, on the far right, you can see, I gotta get some of this stuff out of the way so I can see what I'm talking about here. Just a second. So on the left, it shows some of the indices. And so if you are a meteorologist, you'll understand that a lifted index of minus two and capes of 350 joules are pretty significant instability. But the thing I was really focused on was the precipitable water. And so that means if you take all the water in the column and precipitate it out, it adds up to about 1.87 inches. And that is actually a record for the for any date in Medford. And so it's pretty significant to have that amount of water. You know, it's the record water we've ever had in the, on the Medford sounding for any date, you know, atmospheric rivers during the winter, uh, thunderstorm outbreaks during the summer, any of those. That's the most we've ever had on record. So that, and this is a morning sounding. So all that instability and moisture in the air in the morning is kind of significant. Sorry, I have to move some stuff over again. Okay, so this is just a quick uh, encapsulation of the warnings that I gave. I won't read these things, but just to su it suffice to say that they were well warned. You know, at, at seven o'clock in the morning, I told them that this is about the worst conditions we've ever seen. It's uh, unprecedented water in the atmosphere, lots of instability. And then during the update, I basically just told them exactly what was going to happen. So they were well warned ahead of time. And that was what I wanted to point out here with these uh, warnings. So here's the radar pictures from the event. So this is starting at about 6.35 when I issued the warning to the crews that something was coming. And then it goes through past eight o'clock till about a quarter to nine, after which we'd already knew that flooding was occurring on Humbug or in the vicinity of Humbug, which is of course right here again. And then in yellow, the, the yellow outline is the outline of the McKinney fire. So I'll march this forward. Oh, I wanted to also point out on the initial slide, you see these echoes right here. So that we had thunderstorms earlier in the day that had produced an outflow boundary that I had warned them about. And I'm pretty sure that outflow boundary was still sitting right here as these thunderstorms came in. So you watch these thunderstorms come in and start to interact with that boundary. And they just sort of sit there right along that boundary all the way until about a quarter to nine. So the, the heavy precipitation just sat over that whole Humbug Creek area for at least an hour. And the outlines that you see here, the green outline is for a flash flood warning that was issued by the office in Medford and a severe thunderstorm warning for hail and high winds as well. So that's what you're seeing there on the screen. And that whole thing just sat there. So the result of that was, and this is a radar estimated um, storm total precipitation for that event. And it shows right through the Humbug Creek drainage about two to three inches. So two, the reds, the light reds into the dark reds are between two and three inches of precipitation. So that's the best estimate we have is a two to three inches of rain fell in that area during the event. A couple of snapshots I took of the uh, impacts. So this actually looks like flowing water, but as you can see from the picture on the right, it's the two guys are standing there. It's basically, basically the mud flow that was left over. So that's all the mud that they're standing on. And you can see the water tender dump truck on the left is buried up to its axles and so are the vehicles on the right. Another impact was the picture I showed you on the first slide of the presentation, and that is a, a guy who tried to drive through the floodwaters and get across the bridge, after which, if he had gotten across the bridge, he would have been able to climb an elevation and he would have been pretty safe. Maybe in less than 100 yards, he would have been to safety, but he tried to cross, and this was a result. And the water was flowing from behind me through the truck at this point. And so he aspirated a lot of water, uh, had a broken ankle, but somehow managed to survive. They say if the water come up another inch or two, he probably would have drowned in there. So he managed to survive this and was sent to the hospital and uh, he was released with uh, just the broken ankle as his main injury. I wanted to show these videos. I think I'm gonna save that just until the end so that I can uh, not have to get out of this slideshow and get back in. So we'll continue on, but I'll show these videos at the end. So here's some of the aftermath and these guys are really fast at getting there and fixing things. And so I was there by 10 o'clock the next morning and they had already rebuilt the road, but basically the where this man is standing and where I'm standing, that whole that was a road and the whole thing had washed out, including that culvert that they had replaced. And then across the screen there is where the fire truck is, is the bridge uh, across the humbug. And all of, most of that was washed out too. And then where the guy in the orange is standing is where that truck was trapped. You can see all the, the debris there that he was trapped against. And so if he hadn't 
been lucky enough to get slammed against those trees and stop there, he would have dropped into this drainage. So the trees now are on the right side of the screen. And if those trees hadn't been there, he'd have been washed into that drainage where there was at least, I would say, six to 10 feet of water in there. So he certainly would have had worse outcome than what he ended up with. And this is again on the bridge looking up the Humbug Creek. I think this is the middle fork of the Humbug we're looking up and the main Humbug Creek comes down from the right. So the water was flowing right to left across the screen. And just for some reference, this is a, my trainee on the fire, Sam Roberts. And he's a normal sized man, probably five to five foot 10 or so. And the, you can see we walked about a, about 200 feet up or 200 yards up the drainage and it was at least seven to 10 feet of water that had flowed through that area. And that's up the main Humbug drainage. So significant water flow through there. And then we drove farther up into the burn scar and we saw a lot of scouring from all the water that didn't come down. And then a lot of deposits like silt and sand into some of the drainage bottoms like this. There was a lot of this up there. So I was asked to produce or to show you what basically I used to try and forecast this. And I really wasn't, I mean, there wasn't a particular method because we had historic conditions present, so we knew that we the most moisture we've ever observed. We had a strong upper level, low pressure system offshore with southerly flow bringing all that moisture and humidity and uh, instability up over us. And then we also had a trigger in the form of a short wave in, uh, arriving at the same time. So conceptually, that's pretty much what I use was a conceptual model because you know we have the, all the models in the world and you can look at all different things and we do, but basically the conceptual model said things were primed to go. And if one of those storms happened to come right over the fire, we were in trouble. And then, although the burn severity wasn't known because I had just gotten there and, and you know we really didn't have our heads screwed on straight at that point, I knew that the rainfall was coming when those, if those cells moved over us. And so I basically just treated the entire fire as if it had been nuked, meaning that you know I just treated it all as if it was like you just saw in the previous pictures and just assumed that whatever rain fell was going to run off and cause a problem. And I would say my lessons learned uh, were kind of interesting because the first thing when I came in in the morning, the ops chief said to me, well, Tom, nobody can say that you didn't warn us. And so that was kind of nice to hear on the one hand because I got the message out. But then on the other hand, people were still trapped. You know, they still tried to cross the floodwaters. They still ended up in the hospital. Um, actually, I didn't mention this before, but crews were trapped behind the, the flood and had to spend the night on the hill. So there was a lot of impacts from this storm at the time, not just the stuff that has happened since, but at the time. And so I, I would say one of the lessons learned is you can't be too forceful in your messaging when you have these kinds of conditions because I was as forceful as I thought I should be and it still wasn't enough. And one of the things that was really important was the fire being in my area because I was able to sort of plug and play there where as soon as I got there, I kind of knew what to do and, and how to do it. So it was just a matter of getting everything worked out comms wise and so forth. So that's all I have, and I'll, uh, if I have time, I'll quickly go to those videos because I think that's probably the most important thing of the whole session. And so this first video I'm going to show is of the arrival of the flood. Right now. Right. Right. So I don't know if you're able to hear the, we should probably move one, but there were a couple of other uh, profanity laden ones earlier in that. So I don't know if you heard that, but yeah, they were aware at that point that they shouldn't have been there. Here's another view of the waters as they are continuing to increase. So a short video there. And then this last one is the, oh, one more. I'll do this before I do the last video here. Yeah, this was uh, one of the videos of the, the chaos that happened right there at Humbug Bridge. I'm not quite sure where we're looking. I think we're looking up Humbug Creek right now. And there is the red truck that got, ended up getting stranded.
So hopefully you were able to see those videos. And this last one is of the water receding, but you can see the pictures that I'd shown before, how those trucks are basically buried in up to their axles in mud and silt and sand. So that's what I had to present to you today. And uh, I'm standing by for any questions if anybody has any. Thank you, Tom, for, for sharing some of that stunning, uh, stunning photos and video and also just this kind of perspective on on you know how do you forecast this historic event and how do you do it when the landscape is totally different than than it may have been just just a few weeks prior um there, we didn't have any questions that came in but i please i encourage folks to to go ahead and put those in and uh, we can we can um direct them to tom or to the group after everyone is completed but thanks again tom now we'll uh shift over to uh, Tim Bailey. Tim is the Regional Services Program Manager for the Watershed Research and Training Center. In this role, he facilitates cross-boundary shared stewardship projects with six national forests in Northern California. He also supports development of regional climate resilience and, uh, I'm sorry, regional climate resilience geospatial infrastructure. Let me try to get your slides up here, Tim. Good. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Tim Bailey. And, um, as Joe uh, indicated, I'm uh, a shared stewardship advisor for the North Zone uh, U.S. Forest Service projects, and this is paid for through um, California Climate Investments from 2019 uh, to facilitate uh, third-party implementation partners working on Forest Service land to uh, pursue the state's uh, climate objectives. Um, one of the uh, things I mostly work in, um, you know, pre-fire planning and watershed planning, um, but um, you know, in the post-fire environment, there is so much activity going that one of the, the places that we think that there's a lot of um, opportunity for innovation is to deliver um, uh, data analytics uh, quickly to develop uh, plans because we look at um, the post-fire environment as having, um, you know, there's the, uh, the, the incident uh, team, then the incident repair, and then the, the on the federal system, it's the BEAR program with the Burned Area Emergency Response, and there's similar state program with WERCH, the Watershed Emergency Response Team. And then there's, um, you know, this longer post-fire planning where, you know, in some ways we're setting up for the, the next major management activities. And um, in this environment, um, you know, just downstream from the Klamath Dam, these, uh, the, the fisheries resources in these watersheds are of, um, Kind of a heightened uh, value. Um, so one of the places that we have been focusing is in adapting uh, uh, point cloud uh, tools and task remote sensing um, strategies, particularly for planning forestry projects and watershed restoration projects. But um, um, you know, in this, the post-fire environment, we we really want to support um, um, you know providing the best available. Uh, data to to inform decisions uh next slide uh and this i'm sorry this uh this work was um by myself and michael huggins and we're part of a collaborative group that's been planning with the carrot tribe the yurok tribe and um the mid klamath watershed council as um and um so the uh, mckinney fire the the mo mo most interesting period on this is uh um, you know, the first couple days with the um, extreme fire behavior uh, in the first two days with the 20,000 and 30,000 acre spread days. And then, um, you know, the, the flood events uh, that were alluded to by Tom uh, previously. Um, so this is just giving a quick um, overview of where we're looking at. Um, the, the box is uh, around a photogrammetry, photogrammetry collection that the Iraq tribe um, uh, uh, conducted. Next slide. Okay, so one of the the larger policy initiatives we we have is we're trying to um, provide um, um, better situational awareness of both forest canopy conditions and watershed conditions in um, you know in the project planning environment in general. And we've been working with the North Coast Resource Partnership in developing um, the a current three depth. Uh, collection for Northern California. So the area of the McKinney fire was actually flown in the last uh, weeks of October. And so in the future, it's going to be available um, 
through, uh, there's going to be a QL1 LIDAR collection of um, almost the entire Klamath and the complete Klamath watershed in California will be available, in, though, with a few QL2 uh, portions. Um, now, there was also a 2013 U.S. Forest Service uh, project LIDAR that was for Humbug Creek. So we have this very intriguing 2013 and 2022 change detection opportunity that we're going to uh, go through briefly. Next slide. Um, we've we did three photogrammetry projects in post fire environment. The the one left was on the August complex, which was two years. This summer we did uh, three photogrammetry collections, and um, I should say two of them we facilitated, and the third one was the the Yurok tribe uh, led. Um, so um, we did two UAV collections, one on the August complex for basically facilitating planning and fuels project. Another one in Coffee Creek on the River Complex from 2021, uh, which was a larger project um, and with some geotechnical issues that are not as severe but similar to the McKinney. And then the the Yurok flew this uh, 15 centimeter uh, ground sample distance um, photogrammetry for the um, um, by um, uh, I believe it was Oct August uh, 21st. Um, next slide. Um, and we use these tools for a lot of different things. We spend a lot of time thinking about the the, the stand conditions and, and tree canopy and stand density issues. Um, but in post-fire environment, one of the places that we're spending a lot of time thinking about is where is natural regeneration going to be feasible and where are um, basically our future uh, post-fire, um, where are we going to try to uh, manipulate the environment to create uh, defensible post-fire conditions for um, you know, uh, the, the the language around potential operational delineations is pretty common in our our world, where you know instead of uh, you know we can't reforest um, the the whole landscape. These are massive investments, and since the 2020 fires the, in California, we we're expecting something like two and a half billion dollar backlog in reforestation uh, issues, and so you know really we need to optimize our um, our strategy in the post-fire environment to uh, facilitate the landscape that we we um, uh, you know achieve the the um, uh, a variety of management objectives. Um, so these are a couple of different I would call them user stories. Um, we classify point clouds, we create digital elevation models, we do a variety of uh, hydrologic modeling, and then we do single tree inventories and and various canopy discussions. Next slide. Um, now, so I'm going to focus on two different um, things. These are from the U.S. Forest Service uh, Bear Report. Um, so 4.1 covers actually uh, basically right where Tom uh, was uh, discussing where the videos are, and that's the Upper Humbug Creek by the OHV site. And then the other uh, extreme erosion site that we have spent a little bit of time on is Vesa Creek, which drains to the north of um, into the Klamath and is a steeper watershed. And um, delivered um, ex extreme amounts of sediment. Next slide. Um, okay, so just a quick Humbug Creek. Now this is all worked up from the uh, 2013 uh, US Forest Service LIDAR. Um, and one of the things that we see as the, um, a major issue, you know, we see these extreme erosion events that are, um, the, the McKinney event was a, um, was notable for sure, but um, you know, uh, high severity fire is also just exacerbates a lot of our management issues around culverts and sediment issues related to our roads in the first place. And so, um, you know, we can look at the 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 you know just use standard watershed um, assessment approaches to um, you know identify culverts that are riskier culverts. Um, and those are likely going to be failing in the kind of events and even much smaller events than the the ones that were witnessed in August. Um, next slide. Um, so this uh, this is this graphic is showing um, you know basically the the uh, you know our our hydro enforcement schema to um, identify areas where culverts are where the um, you know uh, upstream accumulation area is predicting. Um, a flow path, um, and then um, you know we're we're trying to detect sites where the culverts are going under the roads, and then basically those are becoming like 
points of potential failure that are um, you know future maintenance issues and then when as we're looking at developing future um, forestry projects these are critical areas to uh, consider and and often in the the bear process the forest service will upgrade the the culverts dramatically um, to accommodate the kind of flows that um, or you know significantly or estimated higher flows than than um, than the culverts are tend to be uh, specced for. Uh, next slide. Okay, and then um, we're so this this area um, this um, this watershed is um, you know it it has observed uh, um, both extreme um, denudation from uh, uh, but we we basically looked at these. Um, the road vulnerability based on upstream uh, watershed condition. Next slide. Um, and then, you know, this is from the 2013 uh, um, uh, letter, but, you know, basically, you know, often we're finding points of uh, problem sites in the, the road infrastructure that are kind of persistent in forestry operations all over the place. So, quality management for maintaining culverts is something that we want to look um you know into the future on but for uh in the post-fire space it's it's especially important next slide um now this is looking at um the photogrammetric point cloud for vesa creek and this is the delta there's been a lot of uh, a lot of photographs we'll see will um vesa is one of the was an extreme delivery site uh next slide um, so this is the this is from the 15 centimeter ortho imagery that the Yurok uh, tribe produced, um, and uh, you can see like you know there's these upstream initiation um, points, and they are closely connected with the road network. You know the the road network basically exacerbates um, opportunities for uh, reeling, and um, you know you can see in the the deep shadowed. Um, that uh, in the 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 reeling is like the formation of channels in you know upper slope areas that are resulting from the the storm event and excessive overland flow uh, during the storm event. Next slide. Um, this is a oblique uh, view of um, you know where we can see mass wasting um, in the the upper reaches of Vesa Creek, and Vesa is an extremely steep watershed. Next slide. Um, okay, and so we use two two sources for this so far. This has been uh, this is a preliminary project because we're um, basically just putting this together for proposals for other projects. But we used um, the project lidar from um, the U.S. Forest Service and then uh, the the photogram tree that the Iraq tribe collected. I think that's the last slide. So that um, so all the, basically what our objective is is to um, kind of to, to accelerate the access to um, uh, you know the situational awareness across fire um, um, and you know facilitate um, planning processes for you know perhaps not the the emergency phase but the the next um, one to ten years of project uh, work we really want to facilitate. Um, um, access to uh, good geomorphic models and and um, you know single tree inventories um, from the task remote sensing projects and so um, we're seeing this as being from from here forward um, with the North Coast lidar and then the the lidar that was flown in the Sierra Nevada for the USGS as well um, that basically California now has uh, systematic coverage of, of LIDAR in that we can kind of standardize operations around the assumptions that we will be able to do change detection before and after fires. Like, um, so um, that's all. Great, thanks so much, Tim. Um, yeah, it was kind of great to see kind of the landscape um, imagery that, that you shared. I uh, didn't have any questions. It's a quiet group so far. So I encourage folks to throw in some questions in, in, um, in the, uh, I think it's the chat box, uh, to the right. Um, and I will turn things over to Spencer Higginson. Let me kick over the control. 
There we go. Spencer has been with the National Weather Service for 21 years. 17 of those years have been as the service hydrologist in the Medford, Oregon Weather Forecast Office. He is responsible for the flood and debris flow programs at the office and works closely with emergency management. Spencer also does post-fire assessments as part of the Department of Interior's interagency team. And uh, hopefully you can take it away, Spencer. All right, thank you. Let's see. I'm gonna move this out of my way. There we go. All right, so uh, I'm gonna follow up on a uh, bit what Tom already started. He talked about the meteorology and uh, <clears throat> the impacts on Humbug Creek, uh, where there were the impacts of the firefighters. I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail on the hydrology and the results of the rainfall on l larger portions of the fire. Um, so th this map is called a burn, or sorry, a, a bark map or soil burn severity map. They're mostly the same. Uh, they are created by a BEAR team, which is, stands for Burned Area Emergency Response Team. Um, a BEAR team typically is activated when a fire reaches 80% or higher containment. And then they'll go look at the damage caused by the fire and they'll try to find what needs to be done to mitigate any negative impacts from the fire. Uh, so this shows, um, let's see. Sorry, one second. So uh, the BEAR team uh, gets the uh, pre and post fire satellite image and they compare the reflectivity and that's how this is created. This map is created, and then they use um, ground truth thing to adjust it to become that soil burn severity map. Um, so this area here is where you can see the problem is probably going to be the highest. It's uh, so they have um, the different uh, threat, uh, the different categories. There's high severity, which is the red. And that's where the greatest change has occurred due to the fire. The yellow is not as significant, but still uh, impactful. And then the low and unburned is where kind of where you see impacts similar to a prescribed fire. So more beneficial impacts. Um, however, we're going to talk more about uh, this part here, which is the uh, the three drainages, which has been have, two of them have been talked about, Humbug and Vesa, and then there's also Little Grouse Creek. Um, you can see here, Tom showed this, I believe, that shows the highest amount of rainfall, which does overlay with a couple of those watersheds. Um, so now we're going to look at those those watersheds. Um, so the watersheds, uh, again, Humbug, Vesa, and then Little Grouse Creek. Uh, I added the label of Little Humbug Creek just to show that the headwaters there uh, share the same ridge line as Humbug Creek. Um, so before we get into it, though, I wanted to make sure everyone was clear on the difference between a flash flood and a debris flow. A lot of times they're used interchangeably, um, but they're not quite the same. Uh, so the next few slides I'm going to show are just uh, examples. They are not from McKinney, so I want, to, want that to be clear. They are not from the McKinney fire, um, but just wanted to show uh, show some examples so we're clear on, on what we're talking about. So this first one will be uh, a flash flood. Uh, so you can see that it's mostly water. It's dirty because it's carrying sediment and some woody debris and probably even some gravels in there and maybe even pushing along some boulders. But the bulk of it is water and uh, and it acts flows and acts like water. And I'll wait till they zoom in here so you can really get a picture of just how much water there is and how powerful that is. That's why you don't cross it. Turn around, don't drown, as we say in the weather service. Um, so some of the signatures that you would find after the fact to be able to determine if it was flash flooding or a debris flow. In the center there, you can see a picture of different layers after a flash flood where you can see that it, it has formed the layers. It has kind of sorted out at different times uh, with like-sized and type material. 
Um, so it'll just you'll see more uniformity in a, after a flash flood. Um, now this is a debris flow, and we're not going to watch the whole two minutes, just the, the first part, because um, it'll give you the idea. So you can see that it's a very slow trickle. Soon you'll see some uh, some debris starts to come through. That can still be a flash flood at times. It's just the initial flush of uh, loose woody debris. But as you watch, you'll start to see it change consistency over time. It starts to change from acting and looking like just plain water and looking more like, if you've ever worked with concrete, uh, it's it looks more like a slurry, like you'd see when pouring concrete. Um, on this close side of the creek, you'll start to see some of that gravel and debris pile up and the flow will continue past it and it'll um, it forms a bit of a levee and you'll see that see levees forming in a debris flow and then as it as the flow subsides you'll see those left behind so that's pretty much all we needed to see as some of the signatures for a debris flow you'll see uh, on the right side you can see that levee that has formed and you can see that uh, that cross section is completely unsorted. There's no uniformity in it, um, no layering. On the left side, you'll see trees with the bark stripped away by the, um, you know, in a debris flow, it's basically like a, a heavy grit sandpaper. Um, all that, all those rocks coming through are just pounding on those trees, ripping bark away and chewing away at the wood. Um, as well as the very large boulders sitting on top of smaller material, which uh, would not happen necessarily in a flash flood event. Uh, once again, the, Tom already showed these, just uh, wanted to demonstrate those signatures. On the left side, you can see that it's pretty uniform, the material that's sitting there. On the, on the right picture, the Humbug Creek is pretty scoured out. Um, not leaving a lot of deposition behind there. It's kind of a choke point, so um, kind of uh, kind of typical what you'd see in a choke point there. Um, this is what you see in most of the smaller drainages, the side drainages coming into Humbug Creek is a lot of uh, sediment deposition. Um, there are there is some uh, rock in there, but I think that was settled out before, and then the uh, deposition on top and then subsequent flows have started to cut through that uh, that sediment layer so another another spot another one of those side drainages in humbug creek um, again more more uniform layers uh, a little bit different than you'd see in a debris flow oh, i don't know why my picture disappeared there we go uh, now I'm going to look up uh, north of Humbug, and well, first I, I believe I put Little Grouse Creek next. Um, so on the left, well, yeah, I guess it's only one picture. I'm seeing my presenter view. Uh, you can see here a massive debris, a woody debris jam, and these were all over both Little Grouse Creek and actually Humbug as well, and, and also in Vesa. Um, a lot of scouring, not a lot of deposition. So I'm not not real sure in Little Grouse Creek if there was a debris flow or flash flooding because I didn't have a lot of good access. So I didn't see a lot. Um, I was lucky enough to borrow some uh, some drone images. Um, let's see. Uh, here, I want you to pay special attention to that grader as well as the bridge at the top of the picture. The, we're uh, looking downstream. Um, the creek did have a little bit of uh, levee formation on the sides. Um, again, didn't be, it wasn't able to get in there very well and, and dig around much and determine flash flood or debris flow. Uh, again, the grader and the bridge. So these pictures are after not after the August 2nd event, which we've been discussing, but instead after the December 26th and 27th event, uh, so just a couple of weeks ago, um, you can see, I'll go back real quick. See, the grader is, uh, well, about two greater lengths away from the channel, and now it's uh, 
surrounded by uh, the flow of the of the creek as it has clearly brought some more sediment and has jumped its banks and um, causing some trouble there. On the right hand side, it's a picture looking along Klamath River Road. Um, and there's a bridge there that has been uh, undermined and uh, damaged. Um, now jumping over to Vesa Creek, uh, on the right side here, you can see a box culvert bridge that has been battered and uh, the concrete has been smashed away on, in parts. And uh, looking up close, the, all of the rebar that remains has been bent over and uh, kind of bent into submission by all the rocks flowing uh, across that bridge and through it. Uh, looking just upstream of the uh, that box culvert bridge, it this is a bit of a levee that has formed and has uh, begun to erode away. And you can see that it's completely unsorted, as you'd see in a debris flow. Um, let's see. Now this is looking downstream from the box culvert uh, bridge. Um, the Klamath River is beyond the debris flow, and beyond the Klamath River is that road uh, with the vehicles on it. You can see, again, a little bit of levee formation there, and as well as several uh, woody debris uh, jams. All up and down Vesa Creek is uh, that sign of, of a debris flow, the chewed away bark and um, with the wood being chewed away as well. There were several trees that had leaves on them still that were, um, they were clearly alive before the event that were, uh, well, that one there is one of them that's tipped over. Um, the root, the roots were intact, but pushed over as they were um, eroded away. And the, you could see on the, going up about eight feet on the, on the uh, trunk of the tree, how it had been chewed away just like the others and then tipped over. Um, whereas if it had been laying down the whole time, it would have been chewed along the whole length of the trunk. Um, this is at the um, mouth of Vesa Creek as it joins with the Klamath River. Uh, you can see how it, the, the debris has pushed into the river and this is just what remains. Um, you can imagine the amount of sediment that, that came through uh, if this is if the large boulders are are what remain. Um, this is a very rough uh, indication of where the bank was previously, and roughly how much of the river is is being taken up by that debris jam. Uh, this is just a Google Earth image looking back up toward Vesa Creek. Uh, you can see that there have been previous flows in the past. There's a, a, a debris field there already uh, with vegetation growing on it. So it's been there for some time. You can see on the Klamath River is fairly uniform width until uh, now looking um, another drone image showing that debris field. Uh, you can see how it's been choked off and I'll just bounce back one more time so you can see the, the difference. You can see that there's that box culvert bridge at the top of the picture. Uh, so from a hydrology perspective and the weather service perspective, now that the fire is out and we're, we just have the aftermath, how do we deal with it? Uh, so we have two different thresholds. We, we create thresholds on all the fires that we have in our area, uh, as do other offices. And we monitor rainfall over, the fire, over those burn scars and when we hit thresholds, we will issue watches or warnings. Um, we have two separate thresholds for the McKinney fire because it was determined that there are a few homes that are in great, at greater risk than, than other areas within the fire. And so to be safe, we've created that lower threshold. We do not issue a flash flood watch or warning at that lower threshold uh, because by and large, the fire is not going to be impacted at that threshold. Uh, we'll wait till that higher threshold to issue the watch and warning. So you may wonder why we have that lower threshold. At that threshold, we will contact the uh, Siskiyou County Emergency Management, and they will contact the homeowners that would be threatened at that lower threshold. So the reason we separate it out is so that we're not warning the larger area when only a small area may be impacted. 
because then it can lead to uh, warning fatigue and people start uh, ignoring our, our watches and warnings. We don't want it to lead to that. Uh, so how do we get to that point or how do we know about of those thresholds? We have um, radar, of course. Uh, so we have rainfall estimates from radar, but it's not always that accurate. Um, there can be beam blockage. Also, the radar is sitting at uh, 7,500 feet, so it can be overshooting some of the rainfall. Um, so what we are uh, planning to do is put a rain gauge in, uh, in the um, kind of the center where those three watersheds come together. Uh, we already have the, the uh, rain gauge purchased. I got it last week, as well as the telemetry. So now it's just a matter of finding a time when I can get up there to put it in uh, after some of the rain and snow that we've had. Uh, that rain, it'll give us 15 minute data so that we'll be able to uh, check on those thresholds. And uh, finally, this is just a view from where we will be installing that rain gauge. That's a view of Mount Shasta. Um, I believe that is it. Great, thanks, Spencer. Um, and I realized that um, we did have some questions coming in. I just hadn't seen them in my, my little sidebar there. So, um, James, I'm, I'm hoping that you've been able to take a look at those. If you might be able to share maybe one of them, since we're running a little short on time, and then I'll introduce Sherry. Yeah, um, I guess I just see a couple that came here. Um, the first one, just going back to Tom. Uh, Nina Oakley asked, it seems that the outflow boundary you mentioned was critical to stalling out the thunderstorms in Humbug Creek. Um, if one was to just look at the steering flow, would it have appeared that thunderstorms would be moving too fast to put that much rain at the location? Uh, yeah, thanks for that question. <clears throat> I had just actually discovered this when I was putting together this presentation, so I haven't really had a chance to, to look into it too much. So. A, I'm not 100% sure that was the boundary that was left over. It just seems to me that it looks like it on radar. And uh, did I say A or B? <laughs> B, I haven't really had a chance to look at that, but that is a good question. But the steering flow was pretty moving along pretty good, if I recall. So I would think the storms would have moved faster and probably blown right through where that boundary was. So that's another reason why I think that may have been a little boundary there that was anchoring or causing the storms to flow right along the boundary train. So yeah. And thanks. I'm sorry we, we ha don't have time for more questions, but we have your questions recorded. And so there's an opportunity that we, that if the, the presenters have some um, reaction to them and have some time that we, that we can follow up with you. So we appreciate you, you putting them into the questions box. Uh, our uh, final speaker is Sherry Whitmore. Sherry has been a fish biologist with the National Marine Fisheries Service for 14 years. Within NOAA Fisheries, she works in the California Coastal Office's Klamath Branch. Her primary roles include working on the Klamath Dam removal and other conservation projects in key areas, such as the Scott, Scott and Shasta Rivers. So hopefully you've got control there, Sherry, and, and take it away. If you have any trouble, just, just holler, and I, I've got your slides too. Okay, thanks, Joe. Um, unfortunately, we're a little short on time, but these past presenters did such a good job. I can skip through some of these um, first slides pretty quickly. Like um, Joe said, I'm a fish biologist on the Klamath, and when we started getting reports that there was a fish kill, um, I live in Southern Oregon, so I was able to travel down to Happy Camp and meet up with some partners um, with the Karuk Tribes Fisheries Department and uh, travel along Highway 96 to investigate what the mechanism was for that fish kill. So um, I think we have a good understanding based on those uh, previous presentations, just how severe these debris flows were. And this picture here just shows um, Vesa Creek and the, the community of Klamath River and Wairika, and you can just see really how denuded those areas are, um, as we heard. And, uh, and then as we traveled up Highway 96, just you know continued evidence of just how severe the fire was. Riparian zones usually don't get um, denuded to this degree, and they are usually a great area to kind of buffer against the, the erosion and um, some of those sediment inputs, but here you can just see it is completely lost that function. Um, you saw some of these pictures, um, Humbug Creek and Vesa Creek um, were the areas that we found. I was there about five days after the debris flow, and um, 
because of all the sediment, we saw these uh, just thousands and thousands of dead uh, fish for about, we suspect that the actual zone of mortality was about 60 miles from Humbug Creek all the way to the community of Happy Camp. And at Happy Camp, um, Indian Creek comes in and that's a pretty good tributary that was able to help dilute some of these impacts. But um, these larger fish are um, large scale suckers and that was the most obvious species that was um, piling up in these eddies and slow water um, areas. But the, the far right pictures you can see, those are salmonids. And um, there was quite a few salmonids in there, um, Chinook, Coho, and steelhead, but also everything, really, dace and crawdads and macroinvertebrates, just everything was impacted and killed for the 60 mile reach. Um, the water quality story really uh, paints a picture of what happened here. And uh, the Kruk tribe has uh, good continuous uh, water quality monitoring and, and put together this um, graph for me. So that uh, if you look at the blue line, that first um, little bump there, that's the, the turbidity uh, measured at the community of Syed. And that was um, in response to that initial um, event, that rain event, when the discharge doubled at, at, for the Klamath River. It went from about 1,000 CFS to 2,000 CFS in the main stem Klamath River. So you see that bump. And then after that, this continued um, increases in turbidity. There were three different slugs of sediment that came down the river. and uh, those are from the different debris flows. And when that happened, the dissolved oxygen completely bottom, bottomed out. So um, we suspect that the fish primarily were killed initially on impact from the debris flow. There was reports of fish just covered in mud up on the banks. Um, that much sediment at once um, likely killed them. But anything that uh, was able to survive would have died from the zero um, dissolved oxygen that occurred right after. And it's especially um, impactful because this is not seasonally appropriate. You know, fish and other species have ways of responding and, and have mechanisms to avoid a lot of these kinds of impacts when they typically see large flow events and um, high rates of sediment in the winter time. They're usually in, in tributaries and off-channel ponds and these slow water refugias so they can avoid those kinds of those impacts. And just quickly here, because I know we're almost out of time, um, the important part for me to really identify what happened here was to contrast it from the impacts that we expect from dam removal, because one of the main pathways that we'll see mortality during dam removal is during drawdown of the reservoirs, when we're going to have high rates of sediment in the main stem Klamath. But that's going to be completely different than what happened um, during this McKinney fire and debris flow. It's just you can see my columns here, it's different season, the exposure to the fish, the intensity of the, the event, the content of the suspended sediment, all this is going to be different. It's important that we acknowledge that since there started to be a little bit of nervousness in Siskiyou County that um, we'd see similar impacts um, during dam removal, which we, we don't expect that to occur. So it's important, next steps, um, monitoring. I'm really curious how the 60 mile reef will recover. You know, you see that many dead suckers, primary pr production, um, all the macroinvertebrates, algae, everything was completely wiped out for a long, re for a long um, range. And um, so repopulation of that reach is going to be really important. And then the Yurok tribe is leading an effort for restoration of upslope bank stabilization, reforestation. And of course, um, a, a big, big topic is landscape scale forestry management. Just this was another indication of how important that is, not just for the forests and the land, but for the rivers. Um, it's really important we start tackling that at a landscape scale. And that's it. We've got one minute to spare. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Sherry. I'm sorry to cut you short. Thank you for, for playing anchor person, though, so, so well um, and keeping us on time. I want to thank Tom, Tim, Spencer, and Sherry again for, for putting together a great uh, a great seminar. Um, and I think looking at this event from a whole bunch of different perspectives is, is really, really thought provoking and really interesting. And I think we should, um, I look forward to doing more of this. Um, but yeah, uh, I thank all the attendees for hanging on. We do have your questions and we'll find some ways to follow up. We'll also be sending around advertisement for our February um, webinar where we'll be going over um, kind of climate conditions and then then coming back to this topic uh, driven seminar in March um, otherwise everybody else you know ha thank you again have a great Tuesday and uh, we'll hopefully see you next month